Hello, everyone. Welcome to the seminar Blockchain Revolutionizing Coffee Trading, the story of Sukafino's Pharma Connect. My name is Tina Ambos. I'm professor of international management at the University of Geneva, and I have the pleasure of hosting this webinar with you today with my co-panelists here, um, and actually the protagonist of the case, uh, David Behrens from uh, Sukafina. He's managing partner and head of training there. And uh, Katya Tatarinov, uh, who is a postdoctoral researcher and the director of the Research Center for Innovation and Partnerships at the University of Geneva. And uh, she is the author and co-author of the case. Uh, I'd also like to welcome in his absence, uh, INSEAD Professor Felipe Montero, who is a co-author of the case and unfortunately cannot be here with us today. So I'm hosting the webinar in his place. The Indicase series uh, was launched by Digital at INSEAD uh, with the generous support of Accenture. And the purpose of this series is to have an exciting, interactive and live discussions of recent cases published uh, by INSEAD. And as you all know, INSEAD has a large library of cases and is a very active producer of new case studies that uh, are all touching upon very relevant recent emerging themes. So we are very happy to discuss with you in an interactive format today, uh, the case of Sukafina. Without any further ado, let us um, delve into the topic. So why did the case of uh, Pharma Connect as an initiative of Sukafina actually um, attract our attention? If we're looking at the list of the most pressing, pressing issues that are currently impacting the global economy, usually digitalization, sustainability, global value chains come to mind. And this case actually covers all of them. So that should be enough reason um, to discuss such a relevant um, and um, up-to-date case. But what really caught our attention of the specific case is that the initiative that they would, was pioneering within Sukafina, the Pharma Connect initiative, which is based on the blockchain technology, it actually is an entrepreneurial initiative. Entrepreneurship is defined as entrepreneurship in big organizations. And we all know that it's notoriously difficult to actually innovate in large globally dispersed organizations. So looking at instances where we really find, you know, bottom up ideas and ideas of employees that really turn into real innovations and initiatives, um, that's something that uh, can have an enormous innovative power, but often it's also difficult to push them through and difficult to make an impact. And as you will hear from David live, um, we had to mobilize several stakeholders across the journey of the Pharma Connect. And this successful entrepreneurial initiative is something um, that I think is really worth highlighting. And I hope we can really learn uh, from David's case here for all entrepreneurs in different organizations uh, that may want to do something similar, that want to venture out to transform them, not only the company, because uh, the Pharma Connect platform really revolutionized what Sukafina is doing. But it also had an impact much beyond that, uh, revolutionizing and changing the entire industry. And yet we're just at the beginning of the whole journey here. And so I want to use this opportunity today to um, discuss this case interactively with you um, and have David actually tell his story. And uh, Katya will actually pitch in and uh, highlight for you the learnings that we actually see from this case and where we think potentially we can uh, all learn from this and uh, be inspired by um, this success. First, David will start introducing the coffee trading industry a little bit, because I guess not many of you are familiar with the coffee trading industry. So in order to get the discussion started a little bit and everybody involved, uh, can we please launch the first poll to see how familiar you are with uh, the coffee that you're drinking every day? The first poll question actually is, how much does the coffee farmer receive when you purchase a coffee from your local coffee shop? 75% of the cup price, 50% of the cup price, 10% or less than 10%. While I let the participants answer this and hand over to David in a minute, I just want to say two more words about the structure of how we're going to run the next hour. So first, I will hand over to David to introduce the industry to us. Then he'll uh, give us some insights into how the initiative was actually 
uh, developed and uh, how he actually mobilized all the different people around him, the funding, the tech people, the different uh, cross-sector stakeholders to actually realize an initiative that really has a social impact. We'll also discuss uh, how this blockchain technology was so useful and important for that type of initiative because we see a lot of technology initiatives uh, launched these days. We see a lot of uh, blockchain on the box, but not necessarily in the box. And we want to highlight why this is a true blockchain initiative and what is so special about it. And last but not least, we want to give you a little bit of a glimpse on um, the future and the road ahead for uh, Pharma Connect as it's um, actually trying to really make an impact and change the whole industry uh, looking forward. So we have our first poll results. And with that, I actually hand over to David. All right, thank you so much, Tina. And I'd also like to say thank you for to NCAD for having me and to Accenture for helping sponsor this. So clearly we're talking to a knowledgeable group of people because you guys nailed it. You, you know the answer is less than 10%. And one of the reasons why the idea of Farmer Connect was really interesting to me was because how little uh, of that cup of coffee is going to the farmer. And I think many times in popular media, we demonize the, the roasting companies, the retailers, but it's a lot more complex than that. You know, there are a lot of costs that come along the way, but at the same time, it showed how just an incremental amount more that could go to the farmer could really change their livelihoods. So with that, uh, maybe before we get into the case, I'll just do a quick overview of the coffee industry, if we can just pull up the first slide. So now that I know that I'm talking to a, a, a fairly knowledgeable group, we can probably go through these fairly quickly. But the starting point, where is coffee grown? So traditionally, it's grown between the two tropics. And the fun thing that I like to tell people is where you grow coffee is where you do not grow wine. And where you grow wine is where you do not grow coffee. So think of California uh, producing wine in the Northern Hemisphere, and then Argentina and Chile growing wine. So those are your wine regions between them, Mexico, all the way down to Brazil and Peru, you have coffee. The same thing might be true for Spain and Italy, where you're growing wine and South Africa, where you grow wine. But again, in between there is where your coffee growing area is. If we go to the next slide, we can see the evolution over the last 20 years of coffee production. So the largest players you can see on the left-hand graph are Brazil and Vietnam. And if you look over the last 20 years, the growth in coffee production that has happened has been predominantly in those two countries. They have the, the cheapest cost of production and the greatest competitive advantage, which on one side you say, okay, that's great. They can produce cheap coffee, which means we can drink uh, cheaper coffee. But on the other hand, there's a lot of squeezing out of other farmers and other players in the industry. And at the same time, in a period of climate change, we're becoming more dependent on just those two countries. On the top right hand side, you can see the types of coffee. We tend to break coffee down into three types or main, two main types. Let's say there's Arabica and there's Robusta. And below Arabica, you have both washed Arabica, which tends to be more the coffees from Costa Rica and Kenya that you might think about or hear about, uh, Colombia being another example. And then you have naturals, which are uh, inferior quality, which are more produced out of Brazil. And what you can see from this graph is that it's really Robusta coffee, which is the lowest quality coffee, which has been gaining the most market share. And again, that's due to efficiencies in roasting, the ability of soluble uh, instant coffee players to use more Robusta and technology. So again, when we think about the traditional coffee farmer, if we think about uh, Juan Valdez, the, the campaigns from Colombia, or the farmer who might be in, in Central America, those are the ones who really over 20 years have not seen much increase in production. Lastly, if we look at the consumption, where is coffee consumed? We can see that the, the EU is the largest consuming block of coffee consumers. And that'll be important a little bit later on when we get into regulation. Uh, after that, you have the United States, and then you actually have Brazil. So Brazil is not only one of the largest uh, producers of coffee, but also one of the largest consumers of coffee. If we go to the next slide, this is how we traditionally think of a supply chain. So of course, it all starts with farmers. Maybe farmers are members of cooperatives, and they're selling the coffee, and it could be the cooperative who then is buying the raw coffee, which is like a cherry. Coffee is actually not a bean. It's actually a seed inside of like what looks like a cherry. And that cherry has to get removed, it then has to get washed, it has to get processed, you have to segregate the small ones from the big ones. And that's where we have the processing of coffee. And that's a, that's a role where in many countries, Sukafina starts to become involved. 
So we might buy coffee from a cooperative who's already processed the coffee for us and it's ready to be exported, or we ourselves might be doing the processing. It's very difficult for farmers to do all of the processing because it requires millions of dollars of assets to, to do the entire process on any large scale. So many times that's why you have cooperatives or exporters, processors who do that. We then have to ship the coffee, be responsible for the quality control. Uh, we have to be in control of the logistics. Uh, when uh, container rates go up in price, oftentimes we're responsible for managing that the financing of it during the entire journey. And then it finally gets to its destination where we then would deliver it to our clients who tend to be more the roasters. Uh, and then the roasters either sell it directly to the consumer or they sell it to a retailer. So that's the traditional supply chain as we think about it. But it, and the reality of my world, if we go to the next slide is a bit more complex. So this is a slide done by the Specialty Coffee Association uh, and they've mapped kind of the actors of the coffee supply chain. And it's not important what you see on here in, in terms, I know it's a little bit blurry, but um, the main highlight is that there's more than 20 actors that we would say are actively part of this coffee supply chain. And each of the points where they interact with, with each other are places where data is being passed. So not only is the physical good moving between different actors, but these are places where we're actually exchanging data about the coffee. It might be uh, transactional data, it might be sustainability, ESG data, but you can see all the interaction points of where data is coming together. So when I started thinking about Farmer Connect, it was looking at this spider web and saying, it's very complicated to move data today. Could there be a better way? So I'll go ahead and stop there and I believe pass things over to Catherine. Thanks, David. I think with that and the complexity that you just showed of, of the map there, we can launch the second poll and get to know a little bit about you, the, the participants in this webinar today. What is your level of familiarity with the blockchain? So are you a blockchain entrepreneur, VC? Do you work for a blockchain enabled company? Uh, do you work for a company that would like to use the blockchain? or you've just read some articles, but you don't work with the blockchain, or maybe you're just curious. So tell us a little bit about you. And as we get started, I'll just give a high level overview of why the blockchain was important for Zucafina and for David and, and why it was important for this initiative. So I think very high level, uh, maybe for those who are just curious, um, the blockchain is a shared immutable ledger that facilitates the process of recording transactions and tracking assets in a business network. Uh, so, as David mentioned, businesses run on data, they run on information. The faster we can get that information, the more accurately we can get that information, the better our business can run. And so what we're seeing now, particularly when we open the newspapers, is a lot of new tech, a lot of AI, the chat GPT. How can we actually apply that technology to some of the problems that we're facing is really what we see in this case study. We saw David had this very complex uh, value chain. He had this complex structure, multiple stakeholders, and he was able to take a technology where the blockchain, one of its major value adds is the transparency that it creates. It's the speed, it's the accuracy with which it enables e efficient uh, data transfer between parties that actually are allowed to see that data. And so he was able to take that and actually use it to solve some of the problems he was seeing in his industry. And I see most of us, there's a few, I'm just getting the results of the poll here. So most of us uh, are not working for a blockchain company or not a blockchain entrepreneur. So most of us are somewhere in the middle. Uh, they've read some articles, they do not work with the blockchain, but maybe after this uh, webinar, you'll, you'll see some of the benefits of this and how you could potentially apply this. And so for us also coming back to what Tina mentioned, what was interesting to see about this case is to see somebody like David, who's been in this industry, uh, knows this industry very well, takes a new technology and is able to apply it. So this knowledge of this industry was very important for him to apply this new technology and then use it to fundamentally transform, transform and create greater transparency in an industry that was traditionally quite opaque. So in the next 45 minutes or so, uh, David and I will actually have a conversation about the three items that Tina mentioned in the, in the beginning. So how did Farmer Connect come about? And David will tell us the story of his entrepreneurial experience. 
Um, what makes, what does the solution really do? What are the ethical dilemmas between using some of this technology? And then finally, we'll look at the future and get to interact with you a little bit as well uh, to hear from you and answer some questions. So David, um, first question. So the initiative, how did it come about and why was Zucafina well positioned to lead on this? Uh, what were the main challenges at the beginning? Tell us, tell us about the beginning of, of your entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, so uh, it, it obviously was not something that I thought that multiple years later, I'd be standing in front of a, an audience in a webinar at NCAD talking about, you know, it was uh, definitely something that started very organically. Uh, traceability has been an issue within the coffee supply chain for many years. It, it's not a new theme. We've been struggling with it for, for decades. And many other people have come before me and have worked on technical solutions. And we just never quite got in there as an industry. And I think that for me, when I was thinking about it, originally, I was very selfishly thinking about how could I build a competitive advantage for Sukafina to build a siloed structure inside of our company that would really go from the farm all the way to our, our clients. And we would gain market share by delivering this amazing traceability solution to our clients. Uh, however, when I would go to our clients and I would pitch this to them, they would say, that's amazing. We love it, but we can't use it. And I'd be like, what do you mean? You can't use like revolutionary, amazing technology that's going to, you know, give you this, this beautiful data sets. And they said, yeah, but what percent of the coffee do we actually buy from Sukafina? As much as we may love Sukafina, we can't buy more than 10 or 20% of our coffee from you maximum because we need diversification of suppliers. And so I said, okay, but maybe all of us can, you know, build our systems and then you guys can, can plug them in together. And they said, yeah, that can happen, but we really don't want to log into 20 different coffee companies systems to get the data. What would be really cool is if we could just go to one place, one login, one system, and we could have access of data and it could be in a standardized format because all you, all of you players send us data in different formats in different ways. So it's even messy for us to, to put together. So it was with that, that I started realizing, wait a second, okay, we could do something for just Sukafina, but if this is really going to be successful, we need to think bigger and we need to go in into a bigger space where this is going to be for the industry. And so you can imagine that the board of Sukafina, who's tasked me to coming up with a digital strategy has the next meeting. And I sit down in front of them and I go, okay, so I'm going to pitch you my, my vision. I pitch it. Everybody's like, this is amazing. This is awesome. And then I go, and I think we should do it open source and we should do it for the entire industry as an independent company. And there is just like crickets, you know, it's like, everybody's looking at each other, like who hired this guy, you know, who, who, th who thinks this is the right idea. Um, but then I started to explain the reasoning why, why our stakeholders, our, our clients were interested in this, and then started to present case studies and ideas of things that were happening at Origin, where you know we don't buy 100% of the coffee that comes from one farmer even. The farmer potentially sells coffee to other competitors of Sukafina. They may sell some of their coffee to us, some to the others, and the farmer themselves may not only sell coffee, they may have other products that they're selling. So I started presenting it as think of an ecosystem and how can you capture that entire ecosystem? It really needs to come with everybody. So it was at that point that, uh, that I got to approval from, from the board and we said from day one, we want this to be independent of Sukafina. We're not doing this for Sukafina. This is something that's being done for the industry. Yes, we're going to put the initial capital into it, but at that point, when it comes time for a later fundraise, we're going to open it up and we're actually going to invite anybody who's using the platform or has an interest to use the platform to also become investors in the platform to dilute Sukafina. And that was how we, we made the initial approach for, for getting over that, that hurdle. Of course, once you get to that point, then you actually have to build it. And it would be really false of me to stand here and say, oh, I was the founder, I'm the one who built it. Um, I know I get a lot of recognition for those things, but I have an amazing team inside of Sukafina who was equally passionate about it as I was and who really have done a lot of the heavy lifting to, to initially get that started. And then once we got enough traction, that's where in 2019, we set up the company. Thank you, David. I mean, this is, um... It's very inspirational. Of course, I could imagine how uh, very revolutionary for you to say that we're going to actually use, uh, do this tool and have the competitors use it. So what made Sukafina so well positioned 
to be able to actually open this up to the ecosystem. What was different about Zucafina than some of the other coffee trading companies? And then also about you to be able to bring all these stakeholders together. Uh, what were the key elements about your history, your past, and, and how you had been positioned in, in the ecosystem yourself to be able to bring together and onboard a lot of these people? Because I guess the challenges were not just internal, probably from the external environment, um, there was also some, some challenges yeah. there. Yeah, there, there's been no shortages of challenges is, is the right thing. I used to have really dark hair. You can see the gray is now there. And I think most of that's Farmer Connect. Maybe part of it's being a father, but there, there's definitely some Farmer Connect gray hairs there that, that were part of that process. But I think Sukafina was uniquely positioned because first and foremost, Sukafina is a very entrepreneurial company. Uh, the DNA of Sukafina is really entrepreneurism, whether it's going to difficult uh, producing countries where maybe uh, most players wouldn't want to go and finding ways to be successful and operate. We, we send staff and trust them to, to execute as many entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs in that case. And also we had had success. So Nicholas uh, Tamari, who's the CEO of Sukafina, before he was CEO, he actually launched a coffee brand in Russia called Ambassador and it quickly became one of the largest coffee brands. So there's kind of a DNA uh, within Sukafina of entrepreneurship and a willingness to experiment. The second one was that the board of directors had tasked me with a digital solution. Uh, so they had said, listen, we need to come up with what is our digital solution? And we were kind of grappling with that at the time. And then the third is we were going through kind of a, a change as a company and who we wanted to be and what identity we wanted. And, you know, I don't say this with pride, but maybe we're a bit of laggards in terms of some of our sustainability program formalization. So we did sustainability work, but there wasn't really a rhyme or reason, a specif specified program around it. So we were really starting almost with a blank sheet of paper. Whereas maybe some of our competitors are a bit more entrenched. Maybe they've already been very successful in building technology solutions five years ago, 10 years ago that, uh, that have been very good. And, and I admire many of my competitors and, and the technology solutions they had built. But those were items that maybe were starting to become a bit legacy, a little bit outdated. And because we were starting from scratch, we could jump into what I thought was going to be the next great thing, which was really the blockchain technology. So, and at the, sorry, for the second part of it myself, um, I had studied finance and thought I wanted to be an investment banker, but on an on-campus interview, I ended up seeing a little brochure that said small business development in the Peace Corps, which is a US service organization. And three months later, I found myself in Bolivia where I did a project for two years, uh, working with 16 cooperatives uh, or 16 uh, villages that created a cooperative. Uh, so I, I had that small experience and this incredible experience. And then from there, I moved to Argentina where I started with a company that was starting a, a energy company. So it was also a startup company. In the case of Bolivia, we did incredible work, but we barely moved the needle. You know, I mean, yes, for about a, for those 16 villages, we were able to change things, but very small in, in terms of uh, moving the needle. And in the case of Argentina, we had an amazing team, an amazing product, and then the government regulation completely ended it overnight. So I had two kind of entrepreneurial experiences, and then I moved into the world of coffee. And when I moved into the world of coffee, I saw the footprint that these organizations had, the size and scale of what they were trading. And I just kind of bided my time. I was learning the industry, seeing what could be done. But I always had this idea. It's like, imagine if I could ever get to a place of authority and leadership where I could actually then wield that tool in kind of an international development mindset that would be really cool. So I, I would like to say that my personal journey has been one where it's been building and I recognize that to really move the needle in a meaningful way, I personally, and I'm only speaking for David, I'm not speaking for everybody, I personally probably could do it more meaningfully inside of a large organization rather than being a pure entrepreneur. And so back to Tina's point of being an intrapreneur, that suddenly became something of a, a focal point for me. We don't appreciate entrepreneurs enough. I think there's always in the news you hear about entrepreneurs, but the entrepreneurs, they don't get as much uh, as much yeah. publicity, right? We, we, well, the entrepreneur doesn't really own the company the way the entrepreneur does. And I think many times we celebrate uh, the, the, the people who've made lots of money and, and what, what that states rather than maybe sometimes the, the impact that's been done. So, but I think a lot of really cool things that have been created during the course of uh, humanity 
have actually come from entrepreneurs inside of large organizations. So I fully agree that, you know, many times people in large organizations feel helpless and it's like, oh, I have to leave my company in order to go do this amazing thing. And I guess my story is, no, you don't, you know, maybe you're at the wrong company and you won't be able to do it. But if you're in the right big company or the right big setting, if they're, if the ground is fertile enough, you can actually do it inside of your company. And it seems that Sukafina really had this culture, the entrepreneurial culture, as you mentioned, that you were tasked with actually, the board of directors was, was pushing you, was supporting you. And then finally, this identity moving towards sustainability, which I think takes us very well into the next um, topic. What does Farmer Connect actually do? And, and some of the challenges there. So I, I briefly talked about the blockchain and how it's you know, enabled you to really open up the transparency within the coffee, coffee industry. What are the ethical challenges behind some of this data collection and one of the elements of the Farmer Connect tool is this digital identity um, that you provide to the farmer. Could you speak a little bit to, to that and, and some of the challenges there with the technology specifically? Yeah, sure. So I, I think when we were setting up Farmer Connect, I had a couple different goals. And the very first goal was that idea of, okay, farmers are only receiving a certain amount of the final price. Is there a way that we can increase that? And the basic idea was imagine rather than just selling coffee, that a farmer could sell coffee and they could sell data. And that's fairly, I mean, it's, it's a simple idea, right? It's not very complex. We all kind of get it, but it's not the way the world works today. Today, in order to do sustainability reporting, you probably have a company like Sukafina who has agronomists that live in the country and they go to the field, they collect data in their iPad or their, their system, come back to the head office, upload it, put it into Excel spreadsheets, and then send that up the chain. And that's how data is getting shared today in the coffee industry. So my idea was, well, how do we include the farmer in this? So actually, even before the blockchain, my first thing was I want to have a digital identity and a digital wallet that can be given to farmers. And the goal of that, I knew it wouldn't be easy, it wasn't going to happen overnight, but the goal of that is to allow farmers to be able to own their data, to be able to control their data, and ultimately to be able to monetize their data. And then when we thought about, okay, so that's the farmer side, then what do we need? We said, well, we need a system where when a transaction happens, when we buy coffee, we Sukafina buy coffee from a farmer, we need a tool that allows that digital identity to be able to speak to a ledger, a database, something else. And, and I looked at lots of different technical solutions. This was not the case of me saying, I want to start a blockchain company and then going to Farmer Connect. It was, I want to do, I have this goal in mind and I don't know what technology I want to use. And as we looked at different technologies, that's where we found out, hey, blockchain would be really cool because you can move digital credentials between people. So when Sukafina buys a coffee from a farmer, the farmer can confirm the price, the quantity, and the quality that they have sold. Immediately, that means that within the blockchain, you have the first block of the blockchain, which is farmer verified data, which should be way better than self-proclaimed data from a trader. So, you know, that for me, that had more value. And for the farmer, they now have confirmation from Sukafina under their digital wallet of a certain amount of uh, coffee that they've sold in a price that they've received, which then leads them to be bankable, leads them to open up on, on other activities, financial. So it was really a win-win. So that's how we started with the, the blockchain. And then from there, it was a permissioning of how that data can get shared across the supply chain. And then the last thing we did is we said, we want to build Thank My Farmer, which was a tool for consumers to be able to take data directly from the blockchain and be able to see it uh, directly uh, in their app. Um, out of the, the different pieces there, which one would you say um, you've had the most challenges with? I mean, you have the pieces kind of sitting at all ends of the value chain. You have the farmer piece with the digital identity of Thank My Farmer, which is more you know, facing the us who buy coffee, right, and trying to, to give back to the farmer. Which one um, has been most successful maybe and which one has, has in, incurred the most challenge? Yeah, so the quickest one was definitely the enterprise blockchain solution. So that was the one where you had big players, uh, obviously bigger IT budgets, uh, already fairly connected. And it, was a, and it was a desire of theirs to move away from Excel spreadsheets and move into something that had a higher level of trust. Because ultimately, blockchain in and of itself is kind of like the cloud. You know, It's not something you see. You shouldn't even really notice it's there. It just facilitates something. 
so that was the one that that was the easiest. The hardest one really is doing the last mile and or the first mile, as we might say, going to the farmer level because there there's a certain amount of uh, training and learning that has to come into play. Uh, you wrote about in the case study, for example, in Cochupe, the Brazil cooperative that we did the pilot, and there it was very successful. We were able to to get the farmers on board, but it does take specific amount of work. And then the the easiest one is the consumer side. Originally, when we were starting Farmer Connect, people said, "Oh, nobody knows what a QR code is. Nobody will be able to, uh, you know, really understand uh, how to even scan it." And well. You know, I guess one benefit of COVID was everybody in the world very quickly learned how to use QR codes, and and that's not been an issue. So, thank my farmer has uh, has taken off nicely. Thank you, David. So I'll hand over to Tina now. There's a few questions on the blockchain in the Q and A that maybe she'll she'll uh, she'll well, ask. Well, you. We'll, we'll be spontaneous and uh, and bring in you know the, the exploding field of blockchain questions that that we're getting now. Obviously, um, just let me summarize a little bit. It's primarily about you know how it really works for the farmers. So do you issue a token? How do you make sure this data can be trusted? What kind of data does the farmer actually upload? And maybe just extending this question also, what kind of data do other uh, players in the value chain actually add to this? Yeah, so uh, in terms of how it works, uh, the digital uh, wallet that was created, that is something that, that farmers are able to use either on a flip phone uh, they can use it uh, on a smartphone, obviously, but not as many farmers have those. And they also have the capacity to do confirmations in person. So we, we had to understand that not all farmers are the same. You might have a farmer in Brazil who's very sophisticated. Uh, you might have a farmer in the middle of a country who you know, has a very low level of education, may not even have a phone, although that's becoming more and more and more rare. So we had to create that fairly dynamically. So the way it works is that the person on the enterprise blockchain who's doing the purchasing of coffee uh, has to register that farmer, and then they're able to send a message, say an SMS message to the farmer. The farmer is then able to do a confirmation via their phone, and then that automatically gets registered under their digital wallet, and it becomes the first block on the blockchain. Alternatively, a code is sent to them at the same time. So if they're unable for fees or for other reasons not to be able to do the confirmation, they're able to take that code to the place of purchase and then be able to enter that code. And then again, that also becomes a recorded transaction at that point. Uh, the blockchain itself, then as the coffee moves through the supply chain, so we think about the processing that I talked about. In general, there's a washing process that happens at one place, a drying and sorting that happens at another, a port place. So as it moves through each of those places, that data of the processing and the batches that are being created become, uh, become part of the blocks of the blockchain that go through. And then when the coffee is sold to somebody new, you can permission, now it's a choice that you have, it's not automatic, but you can permission to share that information with the next person in the supply chain. So if somebody who's exporting the coffee sells the coffee to somebody who's importing it, they have the ability to take the data that they've received thus far and permission it to the importer. The importer who sells it to the roaster then has the ability to permission that data to then go to uh, from the importer to the roaster and the roaster to the retailer. So it, it moves down the chain. And that was one of the interesting reasons why blockchain came into play because we were working under a, a private permission blockchain. There's lots of different blockchains. Uh, ultimately, I knew if it was going to be successful, one, it needed to be private because uh, People who are in the trading business don't want all their data to be public. And number two, we were very conscious of the energy resources. If we were going to go into a public blockchain, if we we're going to go into some of the, the, the other styles of blockchains, they'd be very energy intensive. So we went with a low energy usage uh, blockchain. And then third, we partnered with IBM because when I was pitching this to big global companies, whether they be trading companies or be roasting companies, they needed to pass a data security check. And if I said, hey, I've got a team of three guys in the basement who have built this amazing blockchain, we probably weren't going to be able to pass. But if I could go to everybody and say, hey, this is being done by IBM, there's a login protocol which IBM has placed on it, that gave assurances that it wasn't something that Sukafina could go in and, and take the data uh, because everybody had their own unique IBM logins to, to access the blockchain. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I think you, you answered already five questions like on the go now. So this is amazing. <laughs> I anticipated everything. I saw, a few, I saw a few of them. So I figured I'd take a few off while we yes. were going. Wonderful. Lots of them ticked off. Um, one other question which takes a little bit broader is this issue that how would you actually make sure you get 
competitors in, right? Because initially it was going to be a competitive advantage for Sukafina. Obviously, trading is a very competitive industry, right? And it's not everybody's friends with everybody. So how did you actually convince people that there was like a greater good or for an industry solution to, to be realized? Yeah. So for me to say that this has become the solution of the coffee industry and the commodity trading would be uh, disingenuous. You know, we, we are not there. There are still competitors of Sukafina who are not using Farmer Connect. So I want to keep this real, you know, uh, but we have been able to convince what I call the willing, those who who did want to join, who did believe in the cause, who did believe in what we were doing to to go ahead and join. And one of the first things I did is I created a steering committee for Farmer Connect. This is before we did fundraising. Uh, right as it was becoming a company. And I invited most of my competitors to join that steering committee. And I said, anybody who wants to be a, have a seat at the table to help us shape this, to help us give the form, to help us figure out the governance structure, you're welcome. And so we were able to get multiple competitors as well as some of our clients onto that steering committee. Then when we moved to the fundraising, we did exactly the same thing. The first thing we did is we gave a right of first refusal of investment to those who had participated in the steering committee. So competitors who had been on the steering committee had the right of first refusal to invest into Farmer Connect. And then second, we opened it up to a wider ecosystem. And we were able to bring in several competitors of Sukafina into that fundraising. At that point, the company uh, started hiring staff and we made a point not to hire anybody who had ever worked for Sukafina. So today, 100% of all the staff that works in Farmer Connect has never worked one day in Sukafina in their life. So some of them don't even really know me. So as weird as that might sound. So, you know, we've really built that wall and, and made sure that this is something that is truly independent. And I think that those are the things that have helped to, to build that ecosystem and to get competitors more comfortable with using Farmer Connect. Okay, thank you, David. I think there's many more blockchain questions. Maybe we come back to some of them at the end. So now um, looking ahead, uh, looking at the future, you mentioned at the beginning of your career in Argentina, regulation played a role in, in some of the, uh, the way that some of these entrepreneurial initiatives panned out. Could you talk to the recent regulation changes and how these have impacted Farmer Connect, Sukafina, and potentially the industry as a whole? Yeah, I think that's a great point. And for me, that's probably the biggest pivot or game changer for Farmer Connect from the initial journey to, to where we are today. Uh, because when we first started, I was trying to figure out how do you convince large companies to make this leap of faith? How do you move off of Excel spreadsheets? How do you move into you know, more trustworthy data? And the way I thought about it was these are very large companies worth billions, tens of billions of dollars. They have a massive amount of reputational risk, surely by showing them that there could be a more trustworthy, verified data infrastructure put in place to back up the sustainability claims that they were making, they would wanna do it. That didn't always work. Um, so, you know, we, we thought, okay, then if it's not reputational, maybe it's marketing, maybe it's to show the consumer, hey, you know, let us highlight all the amazing work we're doing. Because the truth is, as much as some of these large companies get demonized in the press, they do a massive amount of work with farmers. I mean, I see some of these large roasting companies that spend tens of millions of dollars on helping farmers, but the work in origin is very rarely shown, there's rarely a spotlight shown on the work that they're doing. So I said, maybe via the data, we can actually humanize coffee a bit more, tell a bit of a story that's factual, that's backed by data, and that can then be shown to the consumers. And maybe that can be a differentiating factor because most consumers say they're willing to pay a premium for products that they can have guaranteed or sustainably grown. So we went in that direction and that was successful. We have many use cases where, where that was successful, but I kind of feel like traceability and digitalization was still a nice to have. Now we're shifting to government regulation where we have the, the European Union, and you might remember from that earlier slide, the largest consuming block of coffee in the world, uh, the European Union is moving forward with deforestation uh, regulation, and coffee is one of the products. So in order to import coffee into the, United, into the European Union, you have to make a factual statement and you have to be able to prove it digitally that the coffee that you're importing has not caused deforestation. A lot of large brands and even some large traders who before said, I don't really care about traceability. I don't need traceability are suddenly like, well, I need deforestation free coffee. Can you provide that? And I always say, well, 
you don't have traceable supply chains. Isn't that what you told me last time we spoke? So how do you expect us to verify that you have non-traceable coffee, but it's deforestation free? And so I have to go back into the pyramid. You have a pyramid. The first layer, the base layer has to be traceability. In order to do any other things, you have to know where your product's coming from. So that has opened up this conversation around traceability and a bit more urgency around building fully traceable supply chains. Once you have that traceability of knowing what farms that coffee is coming from, then you can do things like start doing your polygram mapping, do your satellite imagery uh, analysis to, to be able to measure deforestation. You can gauge in living income, human rights, uh, carbon footprint. So all that good stuff that you hear people constantly referring to it has to come after traceability. And so suddenly Pharma Connect is fielding more requests than ever that, that are coming from traders, coming from roasters, who suddenly see a new urgency to quickly build traceable supply chains, not necessarily for the traceability itself, but also for what they have to build on top of it just to comply with government regulation. So, you know, I'm not a huge fan of government regulation, but I've seen firsthand how regulation is moving the coffee industry faster then we probably would have gone on our own if we had not had it. I really like your description of the pyramid and traceability being right there at the bottom and influencing everything else. If we think about the future of Farmer Connect and are the different technologies that you're now going to be engaging with looking at satellite imagery? Are you looking at um, deep machine learning for analyzing deforestation? I mean, are these some of the next steps that potentially sit in yeah. your future? Yeah, so I think one of the mistakes I made very early on is I was too ambitious. You know, I wrote this white paper and it would it would probably be the equivalent of going to Mars, but for the coffee industry. And I thought we were going to do everything. And I'm a simple person. So I thought this is all easy. I can think it. I can dream it. Surely, you know, developers can build it. And then I found out the reality. It's a little bit more complex. It's a little bit more costly. And it takes a lot more time to actually uh, do cutting edge technology build outs and product development. So one of the things that we've learned is we need to really focus on what we're great at. And then we need to team up with other people who are great at other things. So if we think about satellite imagery and polygon creation, it probably is not Farmer Connect who's going to start doing satellite imagery. It's more going to be Farmer Connect doing the end to end traceability. And you think about those blocks of the blockchain that have the normal supply chain, working with a satellite imagery company who can issue a digital credential. So the way I viewed deforestation in my dream world is that there's a farm, there's a polygon, a satellite imagery company is able to survey that, show that there's been no deforestation. They issue a digital credential that then goes to the farmer ID. So the farmer wallet has that. When the farmer sells their coffee to Sukafina, now they're not just selling coffee. Now they're selling verified deforestation free coffee to Sukafina, which should have a premium, right? Think coffee plus data. So that then gets sold to Sukafina, and then Sukafina is able to then send that coffee on to the roaster, import it into the EU. That same digital credential from that verified satellite imagery company, which is validated by the EU as a verifier, then receives that, that as it gets imported into the EU. That digital credential goes to the regulator. They say it has the green check. That container is free to come in. So I think that Farmer Connect, the, the way we see the path, and we're having these conversations, and it's happening. This isn't just imaginary. These are things that we are actually doing today, is more integrating with other companies and other startups to be able to build those different layers. And in the case of Sukafina, we just last week announced for our, our new borrowing base it's a $725 million uh, borrowing uh, base that we do with lots of different banks that Farmer Connect will be our traceability agent. And that means that data from Farmer Connect is going to be shared also with our banks. So, and that will be not only traceability data, but that's going to be deforestation monitoring data. That's going to become carbon footprint data. That's going to become living income data on supply chains because we have to recognize that deforestation is just one regulation. There's lots of due diligence in supply chain regulations that have passed in, in Scandinavia and Germany and France and other countries. Switzerland has an upcoming vote. So we, we do feel like this is not a nice to have, this is a must have if you wanna be part of the industry. So I think for Farmer Connect, that's very uh, interesting times and a very collaborative time where, where it's working with these other companies to really build something even greater than what we could do by ourselves. I mean, congratulations on that. That sounds fantastic. It's very inspiring. I think there's a lot more questions now in the in the Q and A. So I hand to Tina. 
Thank you, David, and congratulations from my side as well. Thank you. In terms of a related question to this, the obvious one is traceability is not just an issue in the coffee industry, right? It, it, it's in almost all industries we're facing this at the moment. And uh, an obvious one that is very closely related to coffee is cocoa. So, and, and I know that uh, you've also looked into this. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience trying to scale um, the Pharma Connect solution um, into other industries? Yeah, we, we started with coffee because it's what I knew. There, there was no other reason why coffee was the, the first uh, choice of Pharma Connect. It's just, we had that experience and we had networks and contacts within the coffee industry. So building out that ecosystem that, that Catherine was talking about earlier, I could reach out to people and say, hey, I really want you to use this. Please pilot this, see if this can work for your business. Whereas in other industries, we didn't really have those contacts. So that's why we started in coffee, but we have had a lot of traction within the cocoa industry uh, she butter. So we've actually built those platforms. Those are up and running as of today. So we're already in three commodities. There's other other conversations that are happening. And the technology itself is fairly commodity agnostic. So it, it can be applied across uh, all the verticals and potentially even beyond uh, agriculture. You know, it's not something that we want to go too wide too quick. Again, there's something about a, a scale up company that can lose its focus very quickly, want to do everything and not do anything well. And I think that client success and making sure that we're having industry success within those verticals is key to the, the future uh, growth of, of Pharma Connect. So we do want to take a methodical approach, but we're very open to, to having other verticals where, where Pharma Connect can engage with. I think it's a very important point that you made there about, you know, the scalability to the technology certainly is there, but then, you know, how do you build all the sort of this ecosystem and how do you get all the stakeholders uh, involved and uh, signing in uh, in different industries, right? Because yeah. obviously they're the, the, the piece that at the beginning, at least you'd be lacking is, is all your knowledge about the, the, the coffee trading industry and all the relationships that you've built. And what we often see um, also in other industries that if you try to scale uh, a technology solution, especially when we're talking about, you know, ecosystems uh, and complex e ecosystems that are working globally, that have very different partners involved, so that are also regulation heavy. Uh, we often hit boundaries then when it comes to the actual implementation um, in different industries. Another question that um, is kind of the, the flip side of the coin is the social impact for the farmer, of course, right? I mean, we now also have a clear motivation for companies to have this, uh, also monetary motivation, not just a social one, but in terms of the impact that makes for the farmer. Um, let me just read out um, a question by Simon, who actually said, lately, most of quality labels, fair trade, organic, and so on, ended up to become barriers for entry for farmers with little added value to them. How do you see that Farmer Connect makes a stronger positive impact for the farmer? And we've received a couple of other questions going in the same direction. So obviously that's a very critical point to really show, you know, the benefits of that. Yeah, I think that uh, when when you look at Farmer Connect, the goal of Farmer Connect is not directly to change the lives of farmers. The the honest truth is it's a technology solution. The people who use Farmer Connect are the ones who actually can have more of the impact. So, you know, it's not that Farmer Connect can build a technology and automatically farmers make more money. It has to be this traditional supply chain, those who are buying the coffee from the farmer, those who are roasting the coffee, the consumers who are ultimately paying and drinking for the coffee that need to be part of the change. Farmer Connect can give the, the tools to be successful. So one example I always use is I was on a farm very early days of Farmer Connect. And I was talking to, to a friend, a, a farmer friend of mine. And the farmer said, you know what really upsets me? Two things. And I said, okay, great. And they said, maybe Farmer Connect can help me with this. They said, you know, I process the coffee, I wash it. And when I'm done washing it, I have a cleaning mechanism that costs me a lot of money. And it cleans the water from the, the toxins, from the pesticides, everything. It cleans the water before I release it back. But I have a neighbor who doesn't do the cleaning. And I know that they're contaminating and they're just right, right over there. They're, they're my neighbor farmer. But guess what? When I go to sell the coffee, my coffee is sold at the same price as my neighbors. And they said, if you had a way of helping differentiate those who are doing good work on a farm from those who aren't, and there could be a premium paid for the actual work that's being done, that would be for me a game changer. And so again, thinking of that digital wallet that a farmer has, those credentials that a farmer can collect can come from anybody. Now, 
Uh, Farmer Connect has to validate the person who will issue the digital credential. They have to be added to the ecosystem. Uh, but any NGO, any group that's, that has credibility that's out there is able to be an issuer of digital credentials. And so for, so for a farmer, if they have somebody who's verifying that they're cleaning the wastewater, if they have somebody who validates that they're treating the seasonal workers well, if they validate that they're protecting the, the rainforest that's on the land, all those different activities that they're doing in social engagement all can become digital credentials. And the farmer can collect more digital credentials, but they don't have to, when they sell the coffee, give those credentials away. They can choose. So then we get back into this place where you have the coffee itself and you have the data and the farmer being able to monetize that data because if consumers are willing to pay more for sustainably grown coffee and the farmer is the one who's doing the, the work and they control the data of that sustainability. And the only way that you're going to be able to make those claims is if the, the farmers paid a premium for that data, it changes the balance of power. And so I do think that Farmer Connect is enabling that, that, that equalization of power balance. Uh, I'm not saying that it's equal, but I'm saying that farmers are becoming more empowered than potentially they have been before. Yeah, no, absolutely. We also have to recognize that this is a fundamentally different solution than having like a label, like a fair trade or an organic label, where we also know that uh, a, a lot of uh, the costs of this label actually is uh, is disappearing in marketing costs um, of the big companies. So this is kind of giving you a direct access. There were a couple of uh, of questions around the kind of uh, the proof of authority. Uh, you know, why really blockchain? Why is it so important? I mean, you've you've already kind of iterated this a couple of times, but I guess the the, the big question here thinking about it um, is that obviously all the data is like garbage in, garbage out. So Correct. you have to have trustworthy sources in order to validate. So how do you actually make sure that each and every one who is kind of there is motivated and how does the blockchain help you with that? Yeah, I, I think for me, again, we're shifting from a system where people self-report data to a system where people verify each other's data. So if I'm Sukafina today, I can go into an Excel spreadsheet and I can say, oh, I'm buying coffee from Farmer Tina and I paid her this amazing price and I can send it up the chain and, and that becomes valid data within the coffee supply chain. Now, maybe one or 2% of those claims get audited and maybe I get caught for falsifying data. That could happen. But if you go into a blockchain where you're dealing with the farmer on a digital identity, you're dealing with the enterprise solution, and that confirmation is happening, now you don't just have data, you have verified data. And I think that really the power of that is that verification of data. And, and it reminded me, I was in Brazil a while ago, and I was surprised when I went to exchange dollars for reais that they had different values, different exchange rates for how old the dollars were. So like the newer ones got the best exchange rate and the older ones actually got a lower exchange rate. And I said, well, why is that? And they said, well, the older ones are easier to falsify. So we have higher trust in the newer ones. And that really spoke to me because I said, think of sustainability data that way. Should we put the same price on old technology that may be, uh, that could get changed, that may not be 100% factual versus new technology, which has a higher degree of trust and actually comes with validation. And that validation can be, again, from a satellite imagery company validating deforestation. It can be from an NGO that goes to the farm and, and verifies human right conditions. So I think that that validation of different pieces of data is really the unique thing. And I didn't really find something beyond blockchain which uh, could do it as well or do it better. Having said that, I'm not the blockchain and a, a, you know, preacher here. Uh, I'm happy if a better technology than blockchain comes, Farmer Connect is happy to use it. You know, what we want is ultimately this cleaner data system, this better data system for how, how sustainability data, how production, transactional data can be shared among the players in the supply chain. So if there is a better solution that comes, we're, we're open to using it. Thanks a lot. That's it. You have another question, comment for David to maybe wrap up the final rounds of. Uh... Yes, David. So, can you give any advice? What advice can you give to other potential entrepreneurs looking to enact change uh, by launching innovative initiatives? Yeah. So, I, I think that there's a few things uh, that I can say. Uh, Sukafina, we're 1,500 people. 
So we're not 60,000, we're not 500,000. You know, there, there's definitely organizations that are bigger than us. But before Sukafi and I worked in, in commodity trading companies that were much larger. In order to move your company into an entrepreneurship direction, uh, if you have an idea, if you have a thought, if you have a presentation that, that you think your company can do, obviously it needs to be credible. Uh, that's the first thing. And maybe that sounds obvious, but you know, different people are at different stages in their career. If you just got to the company last week and you have this amazing idea, you might be too new. People are going to say, oh, that's not very credible. If you're young, people may say, oh, what do they know? How, how could they uh, see that? So if you're in that situation, then it really becomes about networking with other people in your organization to gain credibility by being able to pitch them. And so I think that being able to, to work in that scenario where you can gain believers and followers and, and motivate people internally in this idea that you have, and as you gain traction with that, and as more people are excited about your idea, then you're able to, to kind of push it up. If you're already at a position where you can uh, influence decision-making, then it's a lot easier. If you already have that credibility, it's a lot easier to move forward with these things. You know, Nicholas, when I came to him, he said, well, you know, first you need to make money being a coffee trader. If you do that, then we consider all, we can consider all this ag tech stuff that you want to do. So, you know, for me, I, I had a prioritization, uh, but I think when you pitch these things, don't forget that the, the leadership's going to want to know what's the return on investment. Well, how much is the budget if we fail and they're going to be more focused on if you fail than if you're successful. But if we fail, how is this going to impact our bottom line? So you need to be able to very clearly articulate, you know, this is the project. This is what I'm envisioning it's going to cost. This is the return. But don't stop on the financial return. Go beyond the financial return. And it was something that Tina alluded to earlier, and I, I think Catherine as well. You have to think about what is the return for the company itself beyond financial means? By Sukafina doing this investment into Farmer Connect and doing this launch, we gained significant amount of credibility with our partners. They, they suddenly saw us as being more innovative. And because we were successful with Farmer Connect internally, people got more excited about innovation. And suddenly we were creating an innovation group. So we have different levels of employees within Sukafina, starting from juniors all the way up to seniors, across finance, operations, and trading. And we meet on a monthly, bi-monthly basis. And those are the people who are collecting ideas from their peers. And they say, hey, you know, I have a peer, and maybe it's a junior trader. Maybe it's uh, somebody junior in finance who's only been with us for a year, but with a fresh set of eyes, they're like, why are we doing things this way? Wouldn't it be really cool if we could do dot, dot, dot? So the committee meets, and we look at all the different ideas, and we pick and choose. And we can then validate the ones we like the most those get presented to the senior management. If the senior management sees all these different ideas and approves one, they then take it to the board to, to get financed. So I think within, within these large organizations, it's all about building those strategic alliances, finding others who are excited about entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship in this case, and then really being able to, to move ideas from idea to, to actuality. Well, thank you so much, David. It was really great advice, great insights. Thank you for, for really being so open and candid about uh, all the different steps in this entrepreneurial journey. So I think what you highlighted very well was really that you need obviously a good initiative, right? But you also need a great entrepreneur to champion it like yourself. And you also need a, a certain company setting. You mentioned that there, there needs to be this DNA for um, companies to accept uh, you know, those initiatives. And uh, obviously with all the, the mobilization of the networks and uh, uh, it's never a linear journey. It's always a, a cyclical wall. It's always a question of development, of tweaking, of getting different uh, players on board. And the other interesting learning that we saw in this case was really that uh, you come from a solution that potentially gives the company competitive advantage to an industry-wide solution, which of course changes the whole story of who are your partners, who do you need to mobilize, what is your legitimacy, but also what is your, your mechanism of monetization and your mechanism of making social impact. And uh, what I personally find truly inspiring is all this work where technology actually tries to create a win-win situation, um, meeting the objectives of the corporation, but also creating social impact. So I think this is an excellent case. We wish you best of luck with your further developments. I hope it will spread across many different industries in the next couple of years. All the best to you, David. Thanks everyone for listening to us. I hope you enjoyed this webinar and uh, wishing you a wonderful rest of the day. Bye-bye.